AWC in Conversation. My name is Joey Clark and I'm here in Sydney. This is Gadigal country and I also note that all of the areas where AWC works around Australia are places which have long been cared for by generations of Indigenous Australians. I'm joined today by Dr Viana Leo. Viana is a wildlife ecologist on AWC's national science team. Her career in wildlife ecology has taken her from Northern Australia to Botswana and she has hands-on experience with animals, both large and small, from African big cats to tiny pygmy possums, as we'll see. Uh, and she's also recently been involved in bushfire recovery projects in New South Wales. Thank you so much for joining us, Viana. Hi, Joey. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. And uh, you're joining us from North Head in Sydney. Um, so what's your setup there? Um, well, I'm out here on the Harbour Trust land, so that's the area that I work on. And um, I've got a little office out here, which is an old um, arterial base, so it's quite nice. It's very quiet, which is good, surrounded by lots of native bushland. Very nice, and, and great to be in um, such a substantial patch of bush so close to a big city. This is one of our least remote uh, properties, I suppose, or projects, so very close to the Sydney CBD. And we'll talk about North Head in a minute. I'm curious to hear, though, about your career prior to joining AWC. You worked in Africa for several years. Uh, what was the first project you were involved in in Botswana? Uh, when I first went over to Botswana, I started up with um, human wildlife conflict. So I was working as a research assistant with human wildlife conflict with lions. So we were radio tracking lions and we had GPS collars on them. So we were looking at the way that they move around the landscape and trying to see what sort of traits were impacting them and causing them to cross into farmland because of the conflict there where they eat cattle, they were getting poached and killed and obviously it's causing um, a, big, a big risk to the population. So we were just trying to determine what those traits were and how we could work on fixing the problems. And uh, I believe this is one of your photos. Um, yes. So a fantastic shot. Um, were you actually getting your hands on the lions, like getting collars on them? Yes, yeah, we were. So we would tranquilize them. Well, we didn't, but a vet would tranquilize them. And um, then once they're out, then you go in and then you, you do all, um, the ecologists can put on the collars and take all the genetic samples as well. So you have to kind of also put the cars in a way that block any other lions from coming in while you're working on that one that you're collaring. We're lucky in Australia, we don't usually have to deal with large land-based carnivores that can you know, pose a threat. What was it like working in an environment where there's multiple things that could eat you? Uh, it's amazing what you adjust to. And I remember before going thinking the same thing and what, we're not allowed to have guns and we, we just walk around and, but you do, you just adjust and you get used to a, a different level of threat. And I find that these sorts of animals are pretty predictable. And as long as you behave correctly and you respect them and you keep yourself safe, then it's okay. I mean, even sleeping in a tent is safe. They just, they don't bother you as long as you don't poke your head out. You also a different predator. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah, so after the um, lions, I went on to work with brown hyenas. And um, that was sort of a small project that I started up, also looking at human wildlife conflict, because there's issues the same with um, lions, even though brown hyenas don't actually take um, livestock, there's still the conflict with surrounding farmlands. And I was also looking at their genetics and I was looking at the way that they use space and their family organisation. Okay, now um, I just apologise, we seem to be having a bit of problem with the internet at my end. Um, can you hear me okay now, Vienna? I can now, yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I lost connection there for a minute, but um, we'll persist and hopefully the connection stabilises. Um, this is the, the Zoom life that we all lead now, so uh, please bear with me and uh, apologise for connectivity. Um, so returning from Africa, you were you're still really interested in working on predators. Um, can you talk about the project that was... Um, Part of your PhD in Australia? Yeah, so when I came back I was sort of wanting to still work in human wildlife conflict and one of the options for that was to work with dingoes. So I did my PhD through the University of New South Wales and I studied the ecological effects of apex predators in Australia, which was the dingo. So I looked in areas where they've been eradicated and compared it to areas where they're still occurring and then I looked at the health of the ecosystem at 
small mammals, number of, of cats and foxes, uh, number of macropods, um, also at the vegetation as well. Um, and what did you find about the importance of uh, apex predators in Australian ecosystems? Yeah, well, my PhD showed that they are quite important. So they do structure ecosystems. So in areas where you had dingoes, you had less kangaroos because they, that's their main source of food. So it meant that you had, um, they were regulated. So they had, there was more ground cover and there were less cats and foxes as well because they also control those. And then in turn, there were more small mammals. So the critical weight range mammals that we have a big problem with in Australia because cats and foxes kill them, they were actually in higher numbers. And also because there's more ground cover in these areas, they have more um, cover to protect themselves from prey as well, from predators as well. Mm, and that's certainly, um, you know, AWC's done a lot of work looking at the feral predators, so foxes and cats, but we know that dingoes are an important part of Australian uh, ecosystems. There's a lot of work being done to untangle those different relationships um, and, you know, whether dingoes impact the behaviour of cats and foxes, there's some evidence to show that they do. Um, but we certainly see dingoes as a native animal and worthy of protection uh, that, you know, that... Uh, part of that ecosystem that we're trying to conserve. So uh, you finished your PhD and how long was it before you started your position with AWC? It was actually immediately. So the day I handed in my PhD thesis, I got a call that I had the job with AWC. So um, and it was actually quite, it's quite good because when I did my honours before going to Botswana, I actually worked on bush rats and um, there was work being done out at North Head on bush rats at that time. And I was working out in Smith's Lake on them. And it sort of kind of worked out quite nicely that I ended up back at North Head after full circle all the way around back working with bush rats again. Yeah, that's so often the way, isn't it? That you, you end up close to where you started. Um, uh, but your first role with AWC was in the Pilliga, and that's when that project was just kicking off. What were you involved with in the Pilliga? Yeah, so when we first got to the Pilliga, I mean, there wasn't even an AWC office yet. So we we're sort of um, setting everything up, I guess, from scratch. And we were designing the ecological health surveys. So determining where the sites were going to be and what surveys we were going to conduct uh, to know that we could determine the baseline of what species were in the Pilliga before AWC management. And we were also worked out where we we're going to put the fence line and did the ecological surveys to see what species were in the fence line. So all of the impact assessments. Yeah, it must be really exciting to be involved at the beginning of a completely new project uh, where there's, you know, there's nothing on the ground. You've got to set up all of those survey sites, establish baselines, and then uh, we've seen the, the progress made at the Pilliga. In fact, I think we'll dedicate a full webinar to the Pilliga project uh, down the track. So stay tuned for more on that work. What we're here to talk about today, though, is AWC's work at North Head Sanctuary. Uh, so AWC has had a presence at North Head in Sydney since 2009. Initially, we were contracted to assess whether or not the area was suitable to be established as a sanctuary. Um, and this is at the northern end of Sydney Harbour. I just want to show you how close it is to the CBD because it's remarkable um, that we've got such an intact patch of bush so close to central Sydney. Um, so this is just from Google Earth. You can see the skyscrapers of the city of Sydney there and the beautiful harbour. North Head, where you are now, Viana, it's only about 10 kilometres from Sydney. It's had a variety of different uses over the years. We know that it was heavily used by uh, Indigenous people, the first Australians. Uh, it's also been used as a military uh, um, armament. So up there, there were uh, all sorts of defences put in place during World War I and World War II. Um, so it's federal land and that's, that's how it came, came to be under the stewardship of the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. So under the agreement, AWC is engaged to provide strategic advice on how best to manage the site, as well as to carry out reintroductions of locally extinct animals. V, can you tell us about working with the other stakeholders on the headland? Yeah, sure. So it's, that's actually a really great shot because you can see how we're surrounded by um, urbanisation, really. And then there's this sort of this area there is 250 hectares um, on North Head. So while it may seem small, you can sort of see quite well from that picture that we're surrounded by urbanisation. So it's quite important as a remaining 
area of um, ecosystem. And um, so it's actually, you can see in this photo, it kind of looks a little bit like a donut. So there's 250 hectares and the surrounding edge outside is national parks. So they manage that land. And then on the inside there is the Sydney Harbour Trust land. So AWC is contracted by the Sydney Harbour Trust to work on that land. And um, we work on there doing scientific um, conservation and research. And then that feeds into the management of the headland. So there's, um, uh, you can actually see though that we don't have, that's just a road, it's not a fence that goes around. So because animals obviously move all over the headland, we have um, a working relationship as well with everyone else. So I work, uh, I have sites all over the headland and I work quite closely with national parks as well. Yeah, and, and can you just describe to us what the headland is like? Because it, it's quite diverse. We talk about um, the eastern suburbs Banksia scrub, which is one of the ecosystems up there. Um, do you want to just talk us through some of the different vegetation communities? Yeah, sure. And it's actually quite amazing. Like, it is amazing because you do walk in and you feel like you're out in the middle of the bush. So you, you feel like you could be a million miles away and then you'll sort of hear people walking around. It's, it's quite a, sort of quite surreal, but um, it is actually quite diverse. And walking out there, you might not realise it at first because mostly you'll just see sort of eco the, the, um, the Banksia scrub. But there's also literal rainforest as well. It's only a small part, but that's down in the gullies. There's forest and woodland, there's heathland, um, and there's actually swampland as well too. So there's um, a really diverse habitat, which creates a lot of different availability of habitat for different animals as well that it supports. Um, and that special uh, ecosystem, which we call Eastern Suburbs Banksia Scrub, um, what's so significant about the patch that's left there at North Head? Um, it's significant because it's one of the only remaining areas that it's occurring. So it is an endangered ecological community and it used to be all along the coastland over 5,000 hectares. Now there's only 3% of the entire community remaining and over 60% of that is actually on North Head. So it's incredibly important to preserve it because if we don't preserve North Head, then that's most of the big half of the population gone, the community gone. So it's, uh, it's very diverse. There's a, a bunch of different Banksia species. I think there's at least seven, maybe more. Um, and then lots of wildflowers as well. And if you go any time from now uh, through to spring, it's absolutely loaded with, with lovely wildflowers and flannel flowers, grevilleas, all sorts of things. Um, and that's actually a resource, isn't it? So, you know, there's a whole lot of nectar producing flowers. What are, what are the animals that would normally pollinate that ecosystem or those plants? So you normally get uh, a lot of small mammals. So you'd have things like brown antichinus, the eastern pygmy possums, you have bush rats, um, gliders, all of these sort of small mammals and lots of them within the critical weight range, are the ones that would be running around sort of feeding on the nectar, spreading it around and helping that um, community to, to produce. Yeah, and that, it's quite unusual uh, having mammals as the main pollinators, but we know that that's the case in this Banksia scrub. Um, I learned recently that that's one of the reasons Banksias have evolved such sturdy flower spikes so that they can support the weight of, of heavier pollinators like bush rats or, or pygmy possums. But a whole bunch of those species are not naturally occurring on the headland anymore. So like other parts of Australia, it's missing a component of its original native fauna. There are still some mammals that survive. So do you want to just tell us about the long-nosed bandicoot population? Yeah, so the long-nosed bandicoot is um, one of the small marsupials that's still occurring at North Head. It's one of the animals that we protect and monitor. Uh, the long-nosed bandicoots at North Head are an endangered population. So while they're not endangered in other areas um, in Australia, they are here because they've been uh, actually kept apart because of all that urbanisation. They've been sort of, sort of like an island, I guess you could say, and they've been kept separate. So they've got distinct genetics, which make them separate from the others, uh, which is why they're classified as endangered. And they've got those long little noses, as you can see, and they go around usually in open areas and they forage for invertebrates and things and pull them out. So you'll get a lot of the kind of like natural filtration system for your lawn, I guess, because they put all these little aeration holes everywhere. Now, um, a term you just used, critical weight range, um, that describes a a class size of mammals that uh, are missing from large parts of Australia. And essentially that means things that are cat and fox food, doesn't it? So they're, you know, between maybe this big and this big or thereabouts. So they're 
by and large, the mammals that have gone extinct in Australia since European colonisation fall into what we call that critical weight range. And that's the kind of pattern that tells us what the main driver of those extinctions has been. So what work do you do with the bandicoots out there to make sure their population is going okay? So we monitor the population in, we work with national parks and we monitor them. We do surveys twice a year just to establish their numbers and to make sure that they're tracking well. So that if anything happens, we can see why it's happening. We can look into it more and then we can help with the management. And so we have sites all around the headlands, so we trap them and then we chip them so you can tell individuals. And we also take genetic samples. So we've been doing research on the genetics at the Longnose Bandicoots. So actually, we just had an honour student that finished up looking at the genetics and her project showed that they are distinct. So we did confirm that they have that different genetics. And then we also do um, monitoring, besides the monitoring, we also do research on their movement around the headland to make sure that we've got enough resources and that we can see what sites they, they have preference for nesting, where they have preference for feeding. And there's actually redesigned, one of the ovals here has been changed since because we've changed the edges and brought it in further because it, they've shown that they need um, open area to feed, but then they need the closed area to nest. And then we also do monitoring for feral predators so that we can protect them. So we put camera traps around the headland and we check for cats and foxes. And if we get any images of them, then we notify national parks as well. And then we also have a um, mortality database that we work on. So any incidents of road kills or things like that, we monitor them and just try and bring in measures to help protect them on the headland. Mm. So that's, that's what's already there. Um, there are also feral animals to contend with. So when we first started working at North Head, it was actually absolutely overrun by an introduced rat, the black rat. And they had completely displaced the native rat that calls that kind of habitat home, which is the bush rat. So bush rats are our friends, black rats are the, the pests in this case. What kind of threat do black rats pose uh, within that ecosystem? Yeah, so besides the main th the threat where they just actually keep other species out if they're, if they're really prevalent, is that they also will eat um, birds' eggs as well. So particularly the ground nesting birds, which if you're trying to establish in a community that's like a lot of heath, you're going to get a lot of birds that put their nests close to the ground and the black rats will go in there and eat their eggs. So it's a big problem, um, especially with listed species that are trying to establish themselves. Mm. Um, at this point, I just want to remind people that you can ask questions as we go using the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, we'll get to some of your questions at the end and we'll try and provide as much information as we can um, after the webinar as well. But remember, you can always go to our website, australianwildlife.org, for more on any of our projects and especially the work at North Head. So V, you're just saying you've got this situation where there were black rats all over the headland the native pollinators had been displaced or, or were locally extinct. Can you talk about our project to reintroduce the bush rat and how we used that species to help control one of the pests? Yeah, so we implemented this, it's kind of a pretty exciting project really, bringing in a native species to work as a control measure for an a, a feral animal as well. So initially they, we reintroduced 180 bush rats and that was done with the idea that if we were able to put them into an area, enable them to establish a territory, that they would then be able to defend that territory and keep the black rats out. So we wanted to not only put a native animal back in the ecosystem so it can help with pollination, but use it as a method to keep the black rats from coming back in. So the bush rats were actually, as I said, there were, only 100, there were 180 reintroduced over a period of three years. And they were only introduced, reintroduced into 15 hectares in the centre of the headland. But the bush rats are now occurring over the whole entire headland. So over a period of 34 months, they actually have expanded to every single site on the headland now. That's really exciting. And like you say, it's very unusual to use a native animal species to help control or, uh, you know, help limit the spread of a feral. So, um, kind of a trailblazing project in that respect. Um, and we should just say your, your predecessor at North Head, Jen Anson, did a lot of work on that project too, which has now uh, been carried on by you, uh, as well as interns and volunteers out there at North Head. So bush rats are lovely little native species. We know that they're important pollinators, but they're just one of the pollinators which would have been found on the headland originally. 
what are some of the other species that we've tried to introduce since then? Yeah, so we've also brought in the eastern pygmy possum and the brown antichinus, and both of these species are important pollinators as well, and particularly because of their tiny size, they're able to reach really um, far branches on the, on the Banksia scrub as well. And um, so I'll just, yeah, I'll just talk about the eastern pygmy possum first, probably one of the cutest, cutest marsupials that exist. Um, they're tiny, so they go from 15 grams up to 14 grams, so around about the size and weight of a 50 cent coin, um, in case you can't really tell from the picture there. And um, they have a little, they're a marsupial and they have a prehensile tail as well, and then they use that to take bedding and things into their little nest boxes, or in, they, they'll nest in like tree hollows and in um, xanthoria and in um, under bark and things like that on the headland. And here's a picture of the prehensile tail. So that, that word just means they're able to use it to wrap around branches and it's almost like a fifth limb. So um, lovely little thing curled up there. So um, I think the first pygmy possums were released, was it 2016 or 2017? Uh, 2017, yeah, were the first ones. So there's been um, 41 eastern pygmy possums reintroduced to North Head now. And the, um, we got them originally from the central coast. So different state forests up around there. Yeah, and we worked really closely with uh, a guy in state forests called Alf Britton, and I've got a photo of him here. He's done this fantastic work making custom made nest boxes out of tree hollows. Um, and this just shows one of them that he's deployed in the central coast. Um, it's essentially a labor of love and he's doing that to provide extra nesting habitat for species like the pygmy possums, but they're also used by antichinus and spiders occasionally and other things. Um, so with those nest boxes in place, first of all, it's a really good way of monitoring small mammals because you're providing that extra nesting habitat. So you can go along, open the lid and see how many of them are being used by mammals. It's also a great way to carry out translocations because you know, you, you can find animals more easily by providing these little safe homes for them. And in fact, in the, the first couple of translocations we did with the pygmy possums, their whole nest box was brought from the central coast or the nearby national park into North Head and, and reattached to one of the branches there. So they were literally moving house uh, from, you know, from where they were into this new area. And we hope that helped them settle in. Um, and V, I, I assume you've been doing monitoring of that population. How are the pygmy possums going at North Head? So the pygmy possums are going really well. Um, we have 65 nest boxes installed at North Head. So it's our way that we monitor the population here. And we do two surveys a year just to check how these populations of the bush rats, antichinus and eastern pygmy possums are going. And um, we've, been start, like, we've been getting all new individuals uh, unchipped so they don't even have microchips in them. So it's been showing that the, they're up to about the third, um, third breeding cycle now. So we've been getting like, last time we checked, we got eight pygmy possums, new pygmy possums without chips. And four of those were females with like three to four pouch young each. So um, they're really, they're doing really well and they're starting to spread out over the headland as well. So it's, it's very good news. That's fantastic. And to think that, you know, these are translocations happening 10 kilometers from the CBD, from where my office is normally. Um, you know, it's a, a really successful project on one of, you know, a, a really significant patch of bush uh, so close to Sydney. So yeah, it is great news. Um, we've got a couple of people just asking about the control of black rats and I, maybe we didn't step through that um, clearly enough. But so at the same time as we were reintroducing bush rats, we were also catching black rats and euthanizing them on site. So it was a, a kind of um, synchronized effort to put pressure, a, a downward pressure on black rats, but also to establish populations of bush rats. And what we found was that because bush rats are territorial, once they've established their territory, they're actually able to defend it against the ferals. Um, so that's, that's been a really interesting way of, as we said, using native animals to supplant black rats, but they didn't do it on their own. So we should have said that, you know, there was also hands-on control of the black rats. And um, just one other thing that I think is pr probably important that I should have mentioned is that the, the surveys now that we're doing, we don't actually have to control the black rats anymore. So it has been really successful. So in the most recent survey we did, we actually got 86% bush rats and only 14% black rats. So that's from 
a situation where there used to be 100% black rats. And um, we're like getting bush rats at every single site and, and the black rats only tend to be in other sites that are sort of poorer habitat. Right, so the, the bush rats are winning. Yes, they are. <laughs> Now, there's a third mammal species that uh, we've also reintroduced at North Head. Um, we've shown before that you've worked with some of the world's largest and most ferocious carnivores in Africa. And this is also a pretty ferocious animal. Uh, wait for it. Do you want to introduce us to the, the brown antichinus? Yeah, this is actually one of my favourites because... Um... Like they might be really, really small, but they're so ferocious and I love their spirit because they'll, they'll bite and bite and bite and they can't actually break through your skin, but they don't, they don't stop trying. So they'll like be hanging off of your fingers and I'm just very, very grateful that they're not bigger because they would be really difficult to contend with. But um, yeah, they're small carnivorous dasyurids and you can, you can see their teeth quite well in this shot. So I mean, they can't actually break the skin, but they are very sharp. And um, these guys eat little reptiles and insects and things like that. Um, they love mealworms. And we reintroduced these as well. Um, we've reintroduced now 44 into North Head. And that was also done over a period of a few years as well. Fantastic. And for most of these translocations, they require uh, supplementary translocations down the track. Are there plans to supplement these populations this year or next year? Yeah, so there is a plan to continue on um, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, the brown antichinus, because they only live for one year, it's sort of necessary to, to get them to really establish, to keep uh, supplementing and the, the populations, but also to boost the genetics. So, and we're doing the same thing for the eastern pygmy possum, although they are establishing, we've been still bringing individuals from different areas, areas where we didn't get the original ones from, and mixing it now, just so that, uh, you know, as we start, we can get them nice and robust and their genetics really healthy, um, which actually is, we, we did that with the bush rats and a recent, a recent um, student just finished his honours and showed that the diversity of the bush rats at North Head is higher than the diversity of where we got them from originally. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And like you said, we've had a number of research projects out at North Head. Getting the genetics right for these translocations is critical and um, you know, it's a whole other branch of the science that underpins this kind of work with our reintroductions. Uh, as you know, we lead the most ambitious reintroduction program around Australia. Um, so there's now about half a dozen sites where we have active reintroduction programs, New Haven, Scotia, the two New South Wales National Parks projects in Pilliga and Mallee Cliffs, uh, Mount Gibson over in the west, uh, Yukamara, where we talked to Helen Crisp last week. Um, and I think what we've, you know, we've just covered this work at North Head, and I think the project there is important for another reason, and that's that it was the first time that AWC had been contracted by government to deliver our model of conservation on public land. So in that sense, it was uh, a, a kind of prototype model for us. Of course, that's now a key part of how AWC uh, is expanding our model around the country. So we've since been invited to deliver conservation on defence land on the Yampi Peninsula in the Kimberley, um, as well as the New South Wales National Parks projects at Mallee Cliffs and in the Pilliga. Um, and we'll talk more about those projects, but really the seed of that idea was this partnership at North Head being contracted to deliver this sort of conservation um, out there uh, on a much smaller scale, but as we've seen uh, very successfully. Okay, we might come to some questions. If you have questions that you'd like addressed, please type them into the Q&A um, and we'll get to as many as we can uh, right now. Um, all right, so uh, we've got a question about domestic cats and foxes. So, you know, we talk often about feral animals, but what about just stray cats from the suburbs adjoining North Head? Are they an issue at North Head? Not as much as you would expect. Um, we do occasionally get incursions around the edges and we've caught them on camera traps. We do have one cat that we call bad cat that pops up now and then and we haven't quite been able to track it to, um, to, to remove it from the headland. But yeah, you would, you would, I guess you would kind of think that you'd get them out here more, but it's not as, not as common. Okay, um, and we've got a camera trap set up. I'm, I forget if you mentioned this already, but we've got a kind of surveillance system in place for ferals. Um, how does that work? 
Yeah, so we just have them around. So they're targeted for cats and foxes and also domestic dogs, which mostly people bring in. They bring them in on lead, but they'll still, they can still attack the wildlife. And we have those set up at sort of likely areas where um, the foxes and the cats are going to come in. So they, they like to walk along pathways as well, so cleared ways. So we put them around sort of behind the houses coming in into the north head um, on the cleared sort of patches there. And then we check those intermittently and any time we get any images, we report them with the location as well. Mm. Um, we've had a, a series of questions, uh, just wanting a bit more information about how you tell a bush rat from a black rat. So the black rats are, well, I'll, I'll let you describe the differences, Fiana, but they're quite different animals, aren't they? Yeah, they, they are. They are. <laughs> it is, a, you know, it does take a little while, I think, to get confident in it, but they are the main, the main way you tell it tell the difference is the tail length to body ratio. So black rats have really, really long fat tails. And if you folded the tail back, it would actually come out a little, the length of the body and then further. So it's longer than the body of the, of the rat. Whereas the bush rat, its tail is shorter than the body. Um, the black rats also have like much more kind of pointy faces as well. They come out into a taper. So the head is smaller than the body. So it gives them kind of like a little arrow shape. Whereas the, um, the bush rats have more of like a flat kind of round, like Roman nose and their head's bigger. So it makes them kind of get this little tubby, dumpling, fluffy looking about them. I feel okay. like when it, if you look at it and you're like, Ugh, it's often a black rat, but if you're like, <laughs> oh, that's cute, then it's usually a bush rat. Okay, that's very a, scientific. Full of thumb. Yeah, but it does take a knack um, to actually distinguish them. Uh, when they're in the hand, it's a little bit easier. Um, and Another question here, just asking about how we actually control ferals, because there's no fence at North Head, and it is, um, you know, unlike some of our other sanctuaries, it's not completely feral free. Um, how is it that we're able to do these reintroductions without having a fence to keep ferals out? So National Parks Wildlife Service have an intensive um, control control of um, ferals at North Head. And also I find that because there is like quite a lot of stakeholders and people out here, we usually find if there's a fox, because they're more of a problem than the cats, we usually find them pretty quick. So I'll usually see their tracks or you'll see a fox scat or a bandicoot will show up or something. And then we'll know to be able to report it pretty quickly. And they usually caught really, really fast, but they are, it is also baited and they do also do occasional trapping as well on North Head. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess there's also just the geography of the peninsula. Um, you know, it's it's naturally kind of isolated, being cut off by essentially manly, that narrow peninsula, um, if you're familiar with the area. Uh, and just mentioning that, I should also say that North Head is open to the public. So um, it's far less remote than some of our other sanctuaries that you might have been to. Um, North Head, you can go and visit. We've got a fairly minimal presence. So there's your office there, Viana, and you might be out doing field work. So if people bump into you, I'm sure they can say hello. Um, but it's been really nicely done. There's paths right around the headland, spectacular views back into the harbour. So you can go and look at this uh, very intact patch of bush yourself if you're in Sydney. Um, so you just go out past Manly and, and up that way onto the headland. Um, a question here about where we source animals for reintroductions. Do you want to talk about that, Fiana? Yeah, so it just depends on the animal. Um, so we've sourced them from a lot of different locations. We do try and mix it. And that can be guided depending on the animal by also we had some help from Australian Museum with the Eastern Pygmy Possums on knowing sort of where to source them to best mix their genetics. So the brown antichinus we had from the northern beaches around different sites in council land and then also from Kurungai National Park. And then the Eastern Pygmy Possums have been from different state forests, so about six different state forests out um, on the central coast as well. And the bush rats the same, out from those national parks in similar areas as well. Yeah, great. So they're all relatively local to um, where we're establishing these populations. The, are there any plans for further reintroductions or other species to be brought back to the headland? Yeah, we would like to look into it. And I think it would be possibly something like the sugar glider would be really good as another pollinator to bring back to North Head. And we do only reintroduce things to North Head that were previously here as well, so that are now locally extinct. Um, but I don't want to do any more reintroductions until we have um, first thoroughly shown that the ones that we've already reintroduced are thriving. So we'll probably look into maybe starting to research some further options next year. Are there any animals that um, uh, you know, towards the top of the list for reintroduction, what would you like to see back there? 
Yeah, I think um, I think sugar gliders would be great. I wouldn't. Uh, Eastern quolls would be really, really good. Um, that's something that would have to be looked into, obviously, because of the bandicoots at North Head as well. Um, but yeah, probably those two would be great. Yeah, I guess using your lion experience to handle a, a quoll, um, you know, that'd be easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I am a fan of the carnivores. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, a question about the bandicoots now. You mentioned that they're genetically unique, so they're a, an isolated population that are um, quite discreet to other populations around Sydney. Does that mean they require uh, more genetic diversity to be brought into the population? Do you think there's a case for supplementing the bandicoots with, um, with more numbers just to mix up the diversity there? I think at some point that might become the case. At the moment they're doing okay, so the research project um, concluded that their genetic diversity was stable, so they are okay. It, but it could it could be better. It's something that needs to be sort of checked. I think we're continuing to take genetic samples, and probably in a few years it needs to be rechecked again to make sure it's still okay. And it's something that definitely could be looked into. And interestingly enough, there were a few individuals at North Head that were showing that they were actually from elsewhere. So I think people were actually um, thinking they're doing the right thing, but they're bringing them from other areas and releasing them at North Head which is sort of an interesting. So I just had a couple of really ones with sort of quite different genetics. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay, that's, uh, well, we're, we're getting close to time actually, so we might wrap it up shortly. Um, no one's asked about this and I'm disappointed in our audience. You really should be asking about fire uh, at all of our sanctuaries. So Viana, although we don't uh, manage fire at North Head, we're in a, a different role there where we don't carry out that kind of management. We do provide strategic advice. What work has been done with fire on the headland? Yeah, so we, yeah, as you said, we don't conduct it, but we, we can advise in the areas that are in need of it. So the eastern suburbs, Banksia scrub in particular, is really reliant on fire for its health. And so there's been prescribed burns around North Head that are conducted. And we do this sort of in a staggered way as well. So it's only like really small plots that are done. The most recent one was two years ago. And it was an area um, out by the swamp where basically the tea tree, which is like sort of like a, um, is a tree, but it grows really, really thick. And then it stops any of the other vegetation from, from um, growing up and doing well. And it takes over when it becomes senescent. So the burn was done through there. And then also we built some fences to stop the rabbits from as they came back, as the, the growth started coming through to stop the rabbits eating. So we built four little fences, uh, separate fences, five hectares, that allowed the bandicoot still to go through, but protected the, um, the regrowth from rabbits and it's thriving. So that area now is really good. You can see the tea tree got taken back and now the Banksia scrub and the heathland is coming up from underneath and you're getting a lot of undergrowth in those areas. Yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you. We've uh, had a number of inquiries about volunteering, uh, especially because North Head is so close to city. What's the best way for people to uh, get in touch about volunteering? So the best way would be to sign up through the AWC website. There's a volunteer section there and you can fill in a form and then, and, and you can also, um, you can also assign which locations and where you live that you're really interested in. So you can sort of put New South Wales and North Head there. And then when volunteer opportunities come up, then I can sort of reach through um, and find some people there that way. It's a little bit more accessible than uh, heading out to Cape York or Central Australia or the Kimberley, um, but no less spectacular. V, thank you so much for telling us all about the work at North Head. It's a fantastic project and you can be really proud of the outcomes that you've achieved there. Thanks so much, Joey. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, thank you everyone for joining AWC in conversation again this week. Um, I hope you're enjoying the series and please get in touch with any feedback or if there's a topic that you'd really like to hear about because we're open to suggestions. Next week, we've got a really exciting update. We'll be uh, getting in touch with Bullo River, and this is the iconic cattle station in the Victoria River District of the Northern Territory. We'll be chatting to Eri Mulder, who you might remember from season one, or you might have met. Um, she's up there at Bullo now, and we're hoping to also chat to the owner of Bullo River Station, Julian Burt. So don't miss it. It'll be a great uh, conversation next Thursday at the same time. Uh, you can find out more about all of this work at our website, australianwildlife.org. And that's where you can also find recordings of all of these webinar conversations. Um, I think that's it. If you're inspired to support our work, please consider making a donation. 
Again, you can do that at australianwildlife.org. Thanks very much and we'll see you next week.